Mr. Russell and Mr. Joseph have the correct formula. I F you are wealthy and want your children to become happy and independent. Adults minimize discussions and behavior that center on the topic of receiving other people's money. Following these statements, one of the other respondents asked Mr. Andrews about the disposition of his business. His comments generated a series of interesting remarks from the more senior members of the group. Mr. Andrews stated, All the money I've been making in my business I dedicate to my daughters and their children. I don't need the money. The kids can use it. I give the maximum within the bounds of the law. What does Mr. Andrews plan to do about ownership of his business? Will he eventually sell it? Will he give it to the children to operate? Or does he have some other idea in mind? I have an agreement with my oldest son. He is required to pay X amount of dollars each year, and Billy will even totally own the business outright. Several of the more senior respondents questioned this plan, since it clearly has the potential to create conflicts among Mr. Andrews's children. Mr. Andrews's business is in the cervic distribution industry. It does not have a great deal of value unless it continues to operate under the Andrews affiliation. In other words, unless Billy Andrews keeps the business operating, there will be no business at all. Asked one respondent, would the business have significant value if you placed it for sale today? Mr. Andrews admitted that it would not. Then why is he requiring his oldest son and key employee to purchase the business? Why not give it to him? Remember, Mr. Andrews gives all of the profits of the business to his daughters. He also plans to give them the revenue he receives from the sale of the business the money his son Billy pays for. The business. Moreover, Mr. Andrews's daughters already receive his able cash gifts from their father, but not Billy. Billy, in his father's SD, Matt Tyon, needs no subsidies. He is extremely productive in generating income. He could always carry a great deal on his shoulders. Mr. Andrews feels that his daughters, on the other hand, do not have the ability to maintain an upper-middle-class lifestyle by themselves. But what about his high-income-producing sons-in-law? In Mr. Andrews's mind, his sons-in-law will never generate an income high enough to support the girls' high-consumption habits. Also, he told us, you can never fully trust your sons-in-law. Divorce is always a possibility. What about future outpatient care for his daughters? Billy, Mr. Andrews's surrogate will provide the solution to this problem. Mr. Andrews's plan calls for Billy to make the payments to his sisters for years after Mr. Andrews's death. The money for these annual payments will come from the profits of his business. Is this unusual? No. Boosie. Ness owners, entrepreneurs, and physicians often find themselves in similar situations. See Table 6, 5, and 6 to 6. In essence, Billy will be required to heavily subsidize his sister's lifestyle, a lifestyle predicated on conspicuous consumption. Mr. Andrews feels fairly certain that Billy will carry out his father's wishes. Perhaps he will. But how would you respond to this plan if you were Billy's wife? Think for a moment. Your husband is paying for his sis. Terse expensive clothing, luxury automobiles, vacations, and so on. Most spouses feel that charity begins at home. Note that spouses are often the initiators of family conflicts regarding inequities in the history, but tie on of wealth. The other participants did not criticize Mr. Andrews's plan directly. When each spoke, he looked at the group in general, not at Mr. Andrews. Yet it became increasingly clear as the discussion progressed that the other respondents rated the Andrews plan a per one. One senior respondent reflected on a related situation. A son grew impatient with his father. The son wanted to take over his father's business, but he did not wish to wait for dad to pass away. So the son opened his own business and actually competed with his father's. Mr. Andrews quickly countered. M.Y. Son signed a non-compete contract with me. Every 
thing in a family is based on trust, isn't it? The participants seemed to think about this statement for a moment. Perhaps Mr. Andrews was having some second thoughts about his plan. Shortly after Mr. Andrews made this comment, he revealed that his children were the executors of his estate. Mr. Harvey then raised his hand and asked if he could respond. We were delighted. Mr. Harvey was the oldest and wealthiest respondent in the group. He began by noting the importance of facilitating harmony among one's heirs. And, according to him, the choice of executors of an estate was critical in this regard. Mr. Harvey had served as executor or co-executor of several estates. He understood full well that being an executor was a difficult task and that there was often animosity among executors and the heirs of estates. For this reason, he had carefully chosen the executors of his estate. I have two children. They are close to each other. They can settle my estate between them, but they will do it along with my attorney. The children and my attorney are executors of my estate. I put the attorney in just to keep the balance. You know when money's involved what can happen. I want to keep good relations, but good rela. Tieships may deteriorate at the last moment without an experienced professional. Mr. Andrews then spoke. He asked with a hint of a challenge. Are you really going to use someone from outside the family? as an executor? In response, seven of the nine participants stated that, in addition to a family member, at least one outsider would be co-executor of their estates. Mr. Ring, a retired entrepreneur and grandfather of nine grandchildren, was one such participant. Mr. Ring had served as co-executor of several estates. He knew of situations in which the heirs to a grandparent's fortune were seriously spoiled children in their late twenties and thirties who did not have the training, discipline, or ambition to support the affluent lifestyle they had been conditioned to enjoy. Several of these adults still lived at home. All had been receiving out the tight care from their grandparents. But, as Mr. Ring explained, once the well ran dry, problems arose. When the grandparents died, the grand. Children and parents became adversaries. Each generation felt it should receive the bulk of the estate's proceeds. These experiences had had a profound influence on Mr. Ring. He realized that long before one passes away, one should select profs. Signals to be co-executors. Consequently, over the years, he had devil. Op-ed close relationships with a highly skilled estate attorney and an outstanding tax accountant. Mr. Ring sought their advice before he retired, realizing that someday these professionals would likely act on his behalf to prevent, or at least reduce, the probability that his grand children would battle over his estate. Through the years, he had also sought their counsel on how to give without spoiling, Mr. Ring now gives gifts to his grandchildren, but not in the form of products or social privileges. And he never gives without first gaining the approval and blessings of his grandchildren's parents. The trusts for the grandchildren are controlled. Money is distributed only when each grandchild reaches certain maturity. I was a little against it, but one listened to my lawyer and tax man. I don't want to reach out from the grave to control them, but the way the trusts are set up, my grandchildren will have to work. Mr. Ring's heirs will not begin to receive their inheritances until they approach their thirties. While some affluent grandparents give their grandchildren products and privileges, the Rings give them educations. Such gifts are intended to enhance their grandchildren's discipline, ambition, and independence. Mr. Graham spoke next. He reflected on his own experiences as a co-executor, which had helped him select co-executors for his own estate. You have to use your judgment. You have to have understanding and compassion. I was an executor of a close friend's estate of a substantial amount of money. I had discretionary power. Every decision was not necessarily dictated. When the daughter aged 23, was ready to marry. 
I knew her father would have wanted her to have a nice wedding, so we gave her the kind of wedding he would have given her. After she married and started a family, I was still not quite sure of her maturity, so I distributed only enough money for her to buy a nice home. Later, I was convinced that she was able to take care of herself, so I approved the distri. But tie on of what was left in the trust. The daughter received the balance of her inheritance just before her 30th birthday, when Mr. Graham judged her to be capable of Han, dling her inheritance. She had demonstrated her maturity in her stable, marriage, role as a mother, and career of her own. When selecting the executors of his own estate, Mr. Graham chose an attorney who was an old friend. He discovered that it's better for the children to be mad at the arbitrator than with each other. Mr. Ward, yet another affluent respondent, had also served as a co-executor. He chose two attorneys as executors of his multimillion dole, Laura State rather than his sons or daughters. One of the attorneys was his niece, the other, a partner in one of the top law firms in the town. Try. Mr. Ward explained his choices. I chose younger attorneys because I felt that they would have a better understanding of the needs of the heirs of my estate. Both have the greatest integrity and understanding, and the two of them know each other professionally. Beyond understanding, empathy, and integrity, another characteristic was critical to Mr. Ward. The attorney who wrote, my, well, was the one one selected as co-executor along with my niece. One felt that if there was a dis pute between my sons and sons-in-law, that he would be a good one to arbitrate. That's the reason I selected him. He's been a personal friend for a long time and a very, as you see, successful businessman. Mr. Ward's comments are congruent with many of our research find. Ings. First, most paws have long-term close relationships with several he professionals, such as top attorneys and accountants. Second, many people in Mr. Ward's category have relatives and or close friends who advise them about wills, trusts, estates, and gift-giving. In fact, all things being equal, estates in which the heirs, typically the sons and daughters, are professional estate attorneys tend to be taxless. Sons and daughters who are attorneys act as formal and informal legal advisors and opinion leaders for their affluent parents. They have a significant influence over all aspects of estate plans, including the choice of the estate attorney, provisions in wills, the ultimate disposition of family assets, the choice of executors, the use of trust services, and the incidence and size of the financial gifts to be given to children and grandchildren. Attorney relatives typically advise their affluent parents on how to minimize estate taxes via annual gift giving to the children and grandchildren. Thus, the mere presence of a son or daughter who is an attorney increases the probability that all the children in the family will receive substantial cash gifts from their parents. Consequently, these children inherit smaller amounts than the norm for all children of the affluent since much of the wealth in their parents' estates is distributed to the attorney and siblings prior to the death of their parents. What were all of these experienced respondents trying to tell Mr. Andrews? First, that his estate was complex, with many subjective provisions. He had acknowledged that his plan contained numerous verbal promises and monetary commitments. Mr. Andrews needed expert advice in how to handle these complex arrangements. He would be wise to consider having an estate attorney slash arbitrator as the co-executor of his estate. 